Hello and welcome to the Weather Quarter. I'm Jenny Woodward. Well, as you know, I've recently been in the US and I've got some more interesting stories that I've gathered. Mark Twain is famously misquoted as saying, the coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. And while the literary debate goes on, there's no denying that city's changeable weather. It can go from high summer in the morning to bitter winter by mid-afternoon. And the fog is notorious. It rolls in over the bay at a moment's notice. Not surprisingly, San Francisco Bay is littered with lighthouses. And I had the opportunity to visit one that has a long history. San Francisco Bay is one of the most beautiful harbours in the world, but it's also one of the most treacherous. In the past, 15 lighthouses played a major role in keeping the bay safe for mariners. Although modern navigation aids have diminished the vital role of the lighthouse, there are some that have continued to shine. The Yerba Buena Light is owned and operated by the Coast Guard. These days, the old Keeper's House is home to the Vice Admiral for the Pacific Coastal Region. Roger Haynes, a Coast Guard volunteer and amateur historian, has tracked the history of the lighthouse and created a museum to honour the keepers of years gone by. Well, the lighthouse is from 1875. Prior to that, there was a bell from about 1873. And so why was it built here? Well, there's a lot of navigation in this area, and this area is very prone to fog. So it became a navigational issue, and several lighthouses were built for safety. Uh, one that has operated continuously, and that's the one that we're at today, uh, a number of them are operating on a very reduced scale. It's essentially a light on a pole. As Roger explains, San Francisco's weather is notorious. San Francisco's pattern is determined by its central valley. The central valley is an area where the air heats up more rapidly than over the water of the bay. So that air rises over the valley, creating a vacuum, and it sucks the air from this area over to that. Which means at 1.30 in the afternoon, you can set your watch, the wind comes up in San Francisco Bay. The layout of the lighthouse has changed over time. The rusted tie-up peg in the rocks is a reminder of the difficulties of maintaining the station before the bridge was built in the 1930s. A modern foghorn has replaced the old model, which is still kept as a reminder of days gone by. And the foghorn was placed on the roof of this building, which is line of sight to the uh, quarters up above. When the keeper lived here, he wanted to hear that, and that wasn't a problem. But when the admiral moved in, the admiral found it a little annoying. So he asked that the, that the foghorn be moved from the roof of the building down underneath it, so that that sound doesn't reach him, but it does project out into the bay and protect the boaters out there. However, some things haven't changed for a long time, including the light's lens. I know for certain this lens was changed out once, and that was in 1913 when the station was electrified. An electric lens is a different shape of lens from the lens used with a gas flame. Roger has a great admiration for the lighthouse keepers of old. The lighthouse keepers are nicknamed wickies because typically they were maintaining a wick, and a wick has to be tended fairly frequently. And there are stories of great courage by keepers and their wives. One day when the relief was ashore, he accidentally set himself on fire with a blowtorch. His uh, wife, by the time she got to him and put out the fire, um, helped him get into the rowboat and he insisted that she stay there to light the light at night, keep navigation safe, while he rowed himself to shore for medical assistance. Unfortunately, he did die two days later. And another time. So when you have a bell to uh, warn people of the presence of land, the bell is driven by a hammer. And that mechanism broke down. She grabbed a hammer, went out, and she beat the bell continuously for over 24 hours and became a legend in the Coast Guard. These days, most of the lighthouses are for show and photo opportunities. But this history buff believes they still have a role to play in modern times. 
A lot of the lighthouses are being transferred into private ownership over either states or nonprofit or organizations. And many of them are preserving them due to the historical aspect, but they continue to operate them as well. And navigation, uh, GPSs do fail, uh, satellites do get out of orbit. Uh, and it's comforting to have an actual working lighthouse to refer to in addition to the modern techniques. And Yerba Buena Island is right in the middle of San Francisco Bay. It's connected to the mainland by the Bay Bridge, which runs either side of it. And the name Yerba Buena means good herb in Spanish. Well, Australia doesn't suffer the bitter winters of the Northern Hemisphere. This year, they had record-breaking snowfalls and it caused widespread chaos. The nation's capital came to a standstill and the traffic in New York came to a halt. Christine Osborne is an Australian who lives in northeast Connecticut with her family, and she told me how they coped. So we live here in the northeast corner of Connecticut. We've lived here for about 11 years now, and uh, we've just come through one of the harshest winters that we've experienced in uh, in our time here. And just to give you an idea of of the effects of that harsh of the harsh elements on not only our home but us personally. Um, we've had this particular year we've had snow in this yard probably up to about here uh, which stayed with us for obviously quite a few quite a few months and the um, the effects of that snow on our home for example as the snow melts through the day and the icicles form along the guttering those icicles, icicles then weigh the guttering down so there are times when we literally thought that we would lose the guttering to our home and for us to maintain our home during that winter period, we have literally turned our lawnmower into a plough. So we take the blades off the lawnmower, we put a plough on the front, and that gives us um, the opportunity to plough our driveway and uh, keep access to our cars. But in also, we also have to use a snow blower, which we would use then to, to take out the snow, and shovels, of course, to get what we can off. If we don't, then that snow then eventually will melt through the day and turn to ice, making it very difficult for, for us to even access the cars. So our children also have to prepare themselves for the, for the harsh winter. Um, they will have to wear a scarf across their face that will protect them from breathing in the ice particles that are in the air. And those ice particles can actually cut the soft tissue in the back of their throat, leaving them exposed to all sorts of viruses and bacterial infections. So as well as the scarf, they also need to protect their extremities wearing gloves and obviously coats and so on to school. But the gloves are there uh, mainly to protect their extremities. Um, they can get frostbite very easily, the, the tips of their ears, their nose, their lips, their fingers, and also uh, the, the dryness breaking you know, putting cuts in their skin and leaving their hands exposed also too to infection. I'm a registered nurse and I work at the local hospital. Um, some of the things that we've seen as, as, as an effect of these harsh winters is the elderly. We um, will often have patients come in that have been exposed to carbon monoxide poisoning from the heating of their home from the wood stoves. Um, anything from that to uh, the elderly found actually dead in their home frozen from um, the inability to heat their home effectively. Uh, as well, we've had um, cases where there's been roadside accidents, just in general accidents, where in nor normal times you know, the ambulance would be able to you know, get to them and, and rescue them. But unfortunately, being exposed to the harsh winters, a lot of them have actually frozen to death on the side of the road before they can actually be transported to the hospital. So I grew up in Townsville in North Queensland and uh, the irony of it is I'm now here in northeast Connecticut where I've gone from at times the extreme heat of North Queensland to the extreme and bitter cold of northeast Connecticut in the United States. There are times when I wish I was back in Townsville. Um, however, when spring comes, it's so beautiful here that I'm, I'm quite happy living here where I am. One of the highlights of my visit to the US was watching the second last space shuttle launch. Endeavour's launch was delayed numerous times, but fortunately for me, that meant I had the opportunity of a lifetime. While the cloud deck interrupted my view, up in the sky, the aircraft was captured on video by sharp-eyed air travellers. 
Of course, delays in shuttle launches are common, and more often than not, they're due to the weather. Space shuttle launches need ideal weather conditions, not only for the launch, but also the landing. Weather forecasts are coordinated by a weather service at the US Air Force Base at Cape Canaveral and the National Weather Service, NOAA. There are many weather criteria to be matched. The temperature has to be just right. Too cold before tanking begins, that's loading the fuel on, or too hot after it's been loaded and the countdown stops. Winds can't exceed 42 knots in the three hours after the fueling begins. Of course, it's not just the winds at the surface, but also in the upper levels. Lightning signals are definite no-go, and there are tight restrictions that need to be observed. There can't be any lightning within 10 nautical miles of the launch pad and the flight path. There has to be a 30-minute wait after the last lightning flash. Generally, the forecast has to show a less than 20% risk of any lightning developing before the fueling begins. NASA requires a direct visual observation of the shuttle as it's launched, but they will allow it to go up if the cloud deck is less than 150 metres thick. While the landings have more tolerance, there are still plenty of rules in place. Visibility has to be at least 8 kilometres, crosswinds under 15 knots and headwinds below 25 knots. And no storms, lightning or rain about. Fortunately, there are a few alternative landing sites available if conditions are bad or the shuttle landing could delay for another day. In a country beset with tornadoes and wild weather, in a local shopping mall, you can have the experience of being in a hurricane without the danger to life and limb. It was all over in a minute and I could laugh about it, but that's the closest I want to get to the real thing. Well, that's the show for now and the end of my travel adventures. I'd love to see your photos too, and you can contact me at weatherquarter at your.abc.net.au. I'm Jenny Woodward. Bye for now.